It was nothing that I did that I survived this crash. I give all of the glory to God. By all rights, I should have died. Everyone around me did die. Those on both sides of me, those in front of me, my friends behind me. I watched them burn to death and die. And yet I lived. I didn't have a burn of any kind. My clothing didn't even catch on fire. There weren't even scorch places upon my clothing. Hallelujah. We're serving that kind of God. And God still answers prayer. Prayer still changes things. It still pays to pray. And as I share this testimony with you, you'll agree with me that our faith can explode when it comes to expecting things from God because he's not limited. He can do all things. He says so, and he means what he says. There are 60 survivors of this crash. Originally, there were 70. Ten have died since the crash as a result of injuries sustained in the, in the disaster. I'm sure if you would talk to each one of the 60 survivors, each one would have their own story of survival because survival is a very intimate thing. It's very personal. I don't believe there's any such thing as any two survivals being exactly alike. And so I'm not here attempting to speak for the other survivors, but I'm here to tell you what happened to me, and I certainly have no problem doing that. When this accident happened, the world was shaken by it. The news media carried the story around the world. It was and is the worst disaster in aviation history. 593 people died. The April 11, 1977 issue of Time magazine carried this story quite extensively. I would suggest you check at your local libraries after you hear this testimony and read the story again. They will have back issues of this magazine on their shelves. If they don't, then you go to your doctor's offices. They always have a real old magazine. You'll find it there. But on the inside of this magazine are a number of pictures. There are some copies of this magazine on the book table in the back if you want to look at it after the service. But across this double page is one long picture. And in that long picture, all you see is one wing of the Pan American 747 on which I was a passenger. And right in the middle of the picture, you'll see me. I was one of the last people to get out of the crash. I'm told there were about two more that got out after I did. I can assure you that as this picture was being taken, that I was under one of the heaviest anointings of the Holy Spirit that I've ever experienced in all of my walk with Jesus Christ. And I've walked with Jesus a long time. I gave my heart to him when I was only seven, and it's lasted all of these years. Isn't that something? I praise God for his saving power, but I praise him for his keeping power, too. He'll keep us a lifetime if we'll let him. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues when I was 12. On December the 12th, 1937, I received that wonderful experience of speaking in other tongues. And that's lasted all of these years, I want you to know. And in these many years, I have sensed God's presence many times, but never until this moment had I ever felt a total engulfment of the Holy Spirit. I had just watched everyone around me die, and yet there I was on the ground working my way across the field without a burn of any kind, rejoicing in Jesus. And down in this corner is also my picture. This was taken about five minutes after the crash. I was waiting for them to come and take me to the hospital. I was observing the final explosions of the two 747 jumbo jets at that moment. I bring this along to prove to you I really was there. If there are any skeptics in the crowd, this should take care of it. God even had his photographer on the job to back up this testimony. I have lots to say, and I'll say it as fast as I can if you promise to listen fast, all right? That makes a good combination. In January 1977, I decided to go to the Canary Islands. Up to that time, I wasn't really sure where the Canary Islands were. I don't have that problem anymore. I know exactly where the Canary Islands are. They're about 70 miles off the northwest coast of Africa. We were flying from Los Angeles to the Grand Canary Island to the city of Las Palmas where we were to board a Greek ship. We were to cruise the Mediterranean for two weeks. We were going to such exciting places as Casablanca, Tangiers, Morocco, Gibraltar, the Greek islands, and Athens, Greece. It was exciting. The trip was booked solidly for a year in advance of the date of departure. It was that popular. I was making this trip with a business companion. I've been a businessman all of my life. I'm not a preacher. I'm a businessman. And all of my working career has been in the business world. About three years before this disaster, I had semi-retired from my business. And I had brought this young man into my business under a purchase management agreement. Eventually, my business would have been his. We were traveling together. It was a pleasure trip. Originally, he and his wife had planned to take this trip together. They had reservations for a year and a half in advance of the date of departure. In January of 77, about 12 weeks 
Before this trip was to begin, my partner and his wife decided they shouldn't take the trip together at the same time. They felt that one should stay home because of business interest. They also were the parents of three small boys, ages 8 to 12. Their oldest boy is a German measles baby. He has serious health complications, including open heart surgery. And so the mother felt she couldn't leave her children. She decided to stay home. I decided to take her place, and that's how it happens. I was on the trip. I was taking her place. I'm glad I took her place. Isn't that something to say after you go through something like that, to say, I'm glad I was there? I've learned many lessons as a result of this experience, and one of the things that I have learned is this, that there is no greater joy for the Christian than to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're exactly where God wants you to be at any given moment of your life. Even if you're in the middle of a jet crash, to know that you're in the center of God's will, I believe is the most exciting thing that a Christian can know. I feel I was in the center of his will that day, and here's why. We were passengers on the Pan American 747. We were seated in the center of the plane, in the tourist section. In that immediate area where we were seated, there were no two people traveling together that were seated side by side, such as husband and wife, that survived the crash. One there, one there, maybe one over here, but no two traveling together seated side by side in our area lived. If my partner and his wife had taken this trip together, more than likely they would have been seated together as husband and wife, probably both would have died. As it is, my business partner did die. He burned to death. The children still have their mother. They're not orphaned. I believe God let me take her place that day. I praise God that he would entrust me with such a mission and how I praised him that he would entrust me with such a message as you're going to hear, because it's going to build your faith. There's nothing negative about this message. It's very positive. I was waiting in my home for my partner to come by and pick me up in an airport limousine. We were going to Los Angeles uh, International Airport together. He only lived a mile from me. In my home, I have living with me my widowed mother. She's made her home with me for the last 20 years. And I share this part of the story with you because it plays a very important part at the time of the crash. This mother of mine is an old-fashioned, Bible-reading, prayer-believing, Pentecostal mama from a long ways back, way, way, way back there. She doesn't like for me to say that. She says it makes her sound too old. But I don't know how else to say it because as far back as I can ever remember, I've had a Pentecostal mama. And we've been weaned on the Word of God, and we've been weaned on prayer, and we've been taught that God's Word means exactly what it says. No ifs, ands, buts about it. If God's Word says it, believe it, accept it, apply it, and absorb it in your everyday living. Because if God said it, He meant it, and He'll never change His mind. A very simple faith. In this simple faith, we've been taught to pray for traveling mercies, and this day was no exception to the rule. As I was waiting for my partner to arrive, my mother said, Norman, bring me my Bible. I want to pray for your trip. I brought her Bible into the living room. Our custom is to open the Word and place our hands upon the Word as we pray. She began to ask God to give me a safe journey there and a safe journey home. Her prayer wasn't unusual, but her tears were. As my mother prayed for that particular trip that day, she began to weep, and she wept bitterly. It was the first time in my life I had ever seen my mother cry. She's not outwardly emotional. I don't even recall seeing my mother cry at my father's funeral. Her tears were shed in the privacy of her own room. I had never seen my mother cry. But that day, for that prayer, for that trip, she began weeping so bitterly she couldn't conclude the prayer. I had to put my arms around her and finish the prayer. And after all of this was over and we started talking about these different things, she said she didn't have a definite premonition of what was going to happen that day. But she said as she began to pray, this extremely heavy burden struck her and the tears automatically began to flow. She couldn't control them. I considered them the tears of a concerned mother that day. But today I find there were there much more than that, that they were actually tears of intercession. How I praise God for tears of intercession. You know, the, the Word tells us that so often we really don't know how to pray or for what we should pray, but that the Spirit prays through us. And how it pays for us to be submissive to the, the will of God in our prayer time, that if the Spirit wants to weep, let it weep. Someday we'll know why, won't we? Praise God for tears of intercession.
My partner arrived. We left for the Los Angeles International Airport. We went to the Pan American Terminal to check in. We went to different clerks to check in, and after walking away from the counter, we compared notes. We found we hadn't been seated together. We were troubled by this. We wanted to sit together to take advantage of the long flying time to talk about business problems. We went back to the counter. We asked them to change our seats and put us together. They said no, the flight was full. I thought they were being very obnoxious, and I told them so. It didn't work, but they would still wouldn't change my seat. They kept me in the same spot. Now I see why. Now I see that God had me exactly where he wanted me. I've always known that God loved me. I never questioned his love. He gave his only begotten son to die on a cross that I might have eternal life and forgiveness of sin. There's no greater love than that. But in all of my Christian experience, I did not realize that God loved me so intimately that he was even concerned about where I was seated on a 747 jumbo jet. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. I realize today that God truly has a master plan for every one of our lives, and that master plan includes such minute things as where we are seated on jumbo jets. It pays to walk submissively and obediently before him every day of our lives. We got to the gate. We were told we would be an hour late leaving Los Angeles. If we hadn't been an hour late leaving Los Angeles, none of this would have happened. We can trace this all the way back to that one hour's delay as being a major contributing factor to our being involved in that disaster. I'll never forget what I saw when I got to the gate. There were 418 people waiting to board that 747 jumbo jet. There were 100 to 150 other people standing around the gate to say goodbye to those that were leaving that day, and there was a great host of people. I can't help but compare the difference and the contrast. When I arrived back in California just four days after the crash, there were only 23 of us left to get off the plane here in California. Quite a contrast. We flew to New York. We were there for an hour and a half. We refueled in New York. We took on 14 new passengers there. We took on a new crew, and we refueled our plane. We took off across the Atlantic Ocean. When we were about 15 minutes out of the Canary Islands, our pilot came on the loudspeaker. He said we were not going to be allowed to land in Las Palmas as scheduled, that there had been a terrorist bombing at that airport, there was a threat of a second bomb, and consequently all incoming traffic was being diverted to a small island 50 miles away called Tenerife. We had not heard of this island before, but we were to learn that it is part of the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands belong to Spain, and they have for the last 500 years. As we were circling over this small island called Tenerife, I was made aware of how very small the island actually is and was to learn later that it's only 52 miles long, 18 miles wide, and there are over 700,000 people living on that small island. It's, it's one of the most exotic places I've ever been, but one of the most crowded spots I've ever been in. And the airport is equally as small. It was not built to receive jumbo jet traffic. It only had one operable runway, for example. And as we were attempting to land there, it seemed to me that it was all our pilot could do to bring our 747 to a halt. And later, as I stepped off the plane, I could see why he was having that problem, because prior to our landing at this airport with one runway, they had already brought in six jumbo jets. We were number seven. And as I looked behind our plane, I counted 11 more jets that they had brought into this little airport. There was a sea of humanity, wall-to-wall -wall people. And as a result of these crowded conditions, we were told we would have to stay aboard our plane. We could not leave it. And that's what we had to do. We sat there for four solid hours doing nothing but waiting. Ironically, there was a 747 standing next to us to our right. This turned out to be the KLM 747 out of Holland. This was the plane with which we would later collide. Prior to the accident, we stood side by side for four hours waiting for our date with destiny. They would let us step off of the plane in groups of maybe 10 or 15 people at a time to get fresh air. On one occasion, as I stepped off of the plane, we could go down the steps and stand around the ground. And, and as I stepped off of the plane on one occasion, I noticed a tremendous mountain by the runway of that airport. I was awed by this mountain. It was different. It turned out to be a 12,000-foot high volcano. A large percentage of the people of that island are thoroughly convinced that Satan resides in that volcano because most of their adverse weather and problems of the island seem to originate in that general vicinity. The volcano erupts occasionally. The airport has been in that location for 20 years, and in those 20 years, they've had six major air disasters right at the base of that volcano. And with this current accident, it brings the total fatalities to over 1,000 people that have died right there in that spot as a result of air disasters. 
to a degree, you can understand why the people feel that Satan must reside there if all of these bad things are going to keep happening. It isn't just the current generation that feels that way because many centuries ago, they named that volcano the Peak of Hell, and it still carries that name today, the Peak of Hell. I noticed a cloud hovering over the top of the volcano. Within 15 minutes, the cloud began to come down the mountain, and within 30 minutes, we were totally engulfed in the thickest fog I've ever seen. You couldn't see across the runway. You could hardly see your hands in front of you. And this was extremely distressing to all of us. By that time, we were totally exhausted. We had flown from California to New York and across the Atlantic Ocean. We had been sitting there for four solid hours. We ran out of food, and we ran out of beverages, and we ran out of water, and we ran out of peanuts. And let me tell you, when an airplane runs out of peanuts, you're in bad trouble. That's the last thing they ever run out of. The pilot came on the loudspeaker at that point. He asked us to sit down and put our seat belts on. He said we were going to begin taxiing. He said the airport at Las Palmas had reopened. Uh, we only had 50 miles to fly. It wasn't quite 5.30 in the afternoon, and, and we knew if we left then, we could get to our ship before dark. And we were so elated over this that we were delighted to sit down and put our seat belts on. And we were so elated that we began singing, and we all began applauding. The pilot came on the loudspeaker again. He asked us to remain in our seats with our seat belts fastened. He said there would be a slight delay. He said the pilot of the KLM 747 standing next to us had decided to refuel his plane at that small airport. He wasn't supposed to have refueled there. He took on 21,000 gallons of jet fuel. This added 142,000 pounds of weight to the KLM 747. And those that are now studying the crash are of the opinion that if he had not taken on that added weight of fuel, that more than likely in his last desperate attempt to rise over us, he could have made it, but they feel that that added weight of fuel kept him down. Our pilot was so angered by this new development that he asked our co-pilot to leave our plane and measure the distance between the two 747s to see if there was room for us to go around the KLM and take off first. Co-pilot did this. In just a few moments, he came back. He said, I'm very sorry to report that we're just 11 feet short of the space that we need. Just 11 feet. We remained in our seats with our seat belts fastened. I can remember vividly seeing the KLM taxi by my window. It didn't take long for the refueling process to take place. Within about three minutes after it taxied by, we started to taxi as well. We were going very slowly for two reasons. I told you that they only had one runway, so we were going slowly to give the other plane time to get out to the end of the runway where he was to have turned in a takeoff position. He was to have remained in that position while we taxied out the same runway to a certain ramp. We were to leave the runway, go on the ramp, wait for him to take off, and then proceed and take off ourselves. We were moving slowly because of the dense fog. You couldn't see anything. We were moving blindly along in pea soup thick fog. They had no ground radar at the airport. The tower could not see us. They had no visual control over us. The pilots couldn't see one another. We were moving blindly along in this thick fog. We just started the taxi. I had taken my pillow. I lay my head on the pillow. I closed my eyes to relax for the few moments it would take to fly 50 miles. It seemed that we just started the taxi when all of a sudden I felt a very horrible, violent jerking of our 747 to the left followed by a slumping sensation as if the wheels had gone into a ditch. We had no warning. Nothing came over the loudspeaker. We saw nothing. It was just a violent jerking of our plane and a sinking sensation. Our pilot said as he was taxiing our 747 down the runway that off in the far distance, vaguely and dimly through this dense fog, he could see the headlights of the KLM 747. He thought the headlights were stationary, and he continued to taxi down the runway, when all of a sudden, to his complete horror, he realized that these headlights were not stationary, but rather that they were coming towards us at a full takeoff speed of approximately 200 miles an hour, and we were still on the runway. Our pilot tried desperately to get our 747 off of the runway onto the grass. This was the violent jerking of the plane that we felt. Of course, we didn't make it. The KLM 747 continued to roar down that runway at almost 200 miles an hour, and all of a sudden he broke through the wall of fog, and as he broke through the wall of fog, he saw us still on the runway, and he tried desperately to rise over us. He got the nose of his plane over us, but the landing gear didn't make it. The landing gear came slicing through our plane like a hot butcher knife going through butter. It actually severed our plane. Our plane was cut in half. It came slicing through the center of the plane where we were seated. I was only eight rows back from where this thing came slicing through. 
The front part of our plane fell forward away from the rest of the plane. We had been cut in half. And most of the survivors came from that section of the plane. As it fell forward, they were somewhat closer to the ground. They didn't have quite so far to fall or quite so far to jump. They had a moment of grace without fire, which we didn't have. They had fatalities in that section, but most of those that lived came from that area of the plane. For example, upon impact of the 2747s, the impact caused the floor of the cockpit to collapse, and the crew members in the cockpit fell down into the first-class section of the plane with that collapsed floor. That's the only thing that saved their lives. And I'd like to add here at this moment that the pilot of our 747 is now a committed Christian as a result of all of this. He's now flying between Japan and California. God will be glorified in all things, won't he? In our section of the plane, just a handful of people lived, and in the tail section of the plane, no one lived, everyone died. They believed that they were all dead even before the flames reached them, because this, an impact of that magnitude creates a tremendous suction and vacuum. And that suction and vacuum go sweeping through the cabins, and the tail end of the plane gets the final suction. It's almost like plane cracked the whip. And they said that uh, this gigantic suction and vacuum sucks the oxygen from the lungs, and the people die instantly. They're dead even before the fire reaches them. Upon impact of the two 747s, all 21,000 gallons of jet fuel released. Our plane was saturated with jet fuel. Not only the outside of the plane, but the inside of the plane. This jet fuel came gushing through our section like a gigantic wave. And many people had their clothing drenched with jet fuel and, of course, became instant targets for becoming a flaming torch by the slightest spark that would reach them. Instant fire. The fire was so instantaneous, for example, that I don't recall even a fraction of a second without fire. The fire was so instantaneous we couldn't even identify the fact that we had been hit by another plane. We thought we had been bombed. We were bomb conscious. Even though I was only eight rows back from where that lending gear came cutting through, I still didn't know that we had been hit by another plane until after I was in the hospital bed. So we had instant walls of fire. We had instant explosions. I don't recall how many explosions occurred before I got out. There were many. I found myself to my feet. I don't recall undoing my seatbelt. I don't remember trying to stand up. I just found myself instantly to my feet, surrounded by these walls of fire. In the window seat next to me was an 86-year-old woman, and next to her in the center seat was her 65-year-old daughter. I was in the aisle seat next to them, and immediately in front of me in the aisle seat was my business partner. The mother and daughter to my left were both crippled. I had catered to them throughout the long flight, trying to help them, bringing them water and so forth. And so as this crash occurred, and I found myself to my feet surrounded by fire, the very next thing I did was to turn to this mother and daughter to see if I could help them. They were already gone. They were both on the floor burning under debris. I believe they were already dead. I turned instantly from that scene then to the seat in front of me to see if I could spot my business partner. And as I did that, there was another tremendous explosion that brought this gigantic wall of fire sweeping through the cabin, followed by very dense black smoke. I never saw my partner again. He, too, was gone. And by that time, people were burning to death all around me, their hair burning, their clothing burning. They were bleeding terribly from cuts they were receiving from all kinds of flying debris, many things flying through the air, parts of planes and parts of bodies. And I, too, was bleeding badly from the cuts that I was receiving. Of course, you'll never forget what you see at a moment like that, and you certainly will never forget what you hear at a moment like that. Our vocabulary is not adequate enough to describe the terror and the horror and the hell that you experience in moments like that. One of the things that I saw and I heard that shocked me more than anything else was this. I actually saw people burning to death, dying, cursing. And I wasn't prepared for that. I've always been of the opinion that if a person was dying and that they knew that they were dying, they would automatically call upon God. But I found that wasn't true. In these jumbo jets, they have what they call little black boxes. These are recording devices that record all conversation that takes place in the cockpit of a jumbo jet. They found the little black box that belonged to the KLM 747. They hurriedly played this tape recording, hopefully trying to find a clue as to what caused the world's worst disaster in aviation history. They were amazed to find that the very last things recorded upon that tape were the violent cursings of the KLM pilot as he came roaring down the runway, and the very last thing recorded was where he took God's name in vain as he crashed into us, taking almost 600 people out into eternity with him. 
in this disaster in Chicago with the DC-10. Once again, they found the little black box. They hurriedly played that tape recording, hopefully trying to find a clue as to what caused that disaster, and once again they were amazed to find that everything on that tape had been erased except one curse word of that pilot. The only thing that appeared on the tape was one curse word. As soon as I could get out of the hospital in Orange County after this disaster, one of the first things that I did was to seek out what I could find written on human behavior. I wanted to see if I could find an answer. I wanted to see why people curse when they're dying and burning to death. I wanted to see if there was an answer as to why jumbo jet pilots would curse as the very last thing they utter as they crash into one another, taking hundreds of lives out into eternity with them. I sought out what I could find written on the subject, and I found that the writers agree. They say that men and women in moments of distress and in times of crises are as they have programmed themselves to be in life. As they have lived, so they shall die. If they've been cursors throughout their lifetime, then they will automatically curse at a moment like that because they're programmed to curse. They don't stop and say, I think I'll curse now. It's automatic. They curse without even thinking. It comes forth from their lips because they're programmed to respond in that manner. And as I read that information, I began to rejoice in the Lord because at that moment I realized that I had been programmed into God all of the time. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. There weren't any curses that automatically left my lips. But the very first thing that left my lips when those 747s crashed together was Jesus! And he was there. Hallelujah. I don't remember a moment or a fraction of a moment that I wasn't aware of the presence of Jesus Christ. I thought I would die. I assumed I would die. Everyone around me seemed to be dying. But at that moment, it didn't seem to matter to me. The only thing that was important to me at that moment was whether I sensed the presence of God, whether I sensed the presence of Jesus Christ. I knew that if I lived, Jesus was with me, but I also knew that if I died, Jesus was with me. Hallelujah. And I believe that's the way it is for the Christian when it comes time to die. I believe at that final moment, the only thing that's going to matter is whether you sense the presence of Jesus Christ. And if you're walking with Jesus Christ and your sins have been forgiven and you know you're on your way to heaven, then let me encourage you by saying you are programmed into God and I want you to know it and in that moment you're going to say Jesus and he's going to be there because he said he would be and if he said it he meant it then that should be enough. Hallelujah. The first thing that went through my mind was it isn't real, it isn't happening, it cannot be real. It seems to take a fraction of time for your mind to actually grasp the fact that you truly are in an inferno. The mind rebels against it, it doesn't want to accept that. The next thing that went through my mind was I've been through this before I've gone through this before. A strange reaction. Of course, I'd never been through that before. These things were happening in fractions of seconds. If you freeze with any one of these reactions, you die. They say that you have no more than 90 seconds to do whatever you're going to do in a disaster like that. Usually not 90 seconds, but never more than 90 seconds. And I can assure you that those 90 seconds go by very fast. And I can also assure you that those 90 seconds are filled to overflowing with your fight for survival. That's the only thing that's on your mind. Survival. You're not thinking about dying. You're thinking about living. There's no time in those 90 seconds to pray a sinner's prayer. You don't even think about a sinner's prayer. It doesn't even flash across your mind. There's no time in those 90 seconds to try to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ. You don't even think about that. You're thinking only about survival. There's no time in those 90 seconds to be filled with remorse because there's things in your life that have kept you and are keeping you from the divine will of God and a full understanding of God. You don't think about those things. The Bible tells us clearly that today is the day of salvation. It doesn't say anything about a moment like that. It says today. It doesn't say anything about tomorrow. It says today. And I believe firmly and with all of my heart that God gives us such opportunities as we have in this dining room tonight to make our peace with Jesus Christ. And if we don't take advantage of these moments, then we cannot blame God if we go out into a Christless eternity at a moment like that. I truly believe that God's Spirit strives with man. And throughout our lifetime, there's time after time after time that we have opportunities to make our peace with God. And if we don't take advantage of those times, then we cannot blame anyone but ourselves if we go out into eternity at a moment like that without Him. There were 55 people on that plane that did absolutely nothing towards their survival. 
They sat in their seats like zombies, staring ahead with a glassy stare. They didn't try to undo their seatbelts. They didn't try to stand up. They just remained in their seats in silence, I'm told, until the flames finally reached them and they began to melt away like wax mannequins. Totally overcome with shock, fear, and confusion to the extent that they did nothing but sit there and die. And as I read that information and realized what they were saying, I was made to be convinced that this cannot be the will of God for his people, that one of his children at a moment like that should sit there frozen with fear and shock and confusion to the extent that they do nothing but sit there and die. It can't be God's will. The scripture tells us that if our minds are stayed upon him, they will be kept in perfect peace. And that includes a moment like that. It doesn't exclude that moment. It includes every moment. That if our minds are stayed upon him, they will be kept in perfect peace. And even in a disaster such as that, we can sense and witness the power of God and through his, the wooing of his Holy Spirit, be led into safety. Hallelujah! There were moments as I fought my way through those flames that I almost felt the physical nudging of the Holy Spirit to go this way, don't go that way. Do this, don't do that. The faithfulness of God. There was an Assembly of God woman on that plane from the state of Washington by the name of Irma Schleck. And she said that as this crash happened and these two giant 747s crashed into one another, her very first impulse was to step quickly out into the aisle. And she said as she stepped out into the aisle, she heard the voice of God speak loudly to her. And the voice of God said, get out of the aisle. And she stepped quickly back in front of her seat, just as this gigantic flaming sheet of metal came slicing down in the very spot where she had been standing. And she said as she gazed upon that flaming metal and realized what God through his faithfulness and Holy Spirit did for her, she said she became so heavily anointed with the Holy Spirit that all of a sudden she began leaping over the tops of the seats like a gazelle out into freedom. Hallelujah. <laughs> and how it pays for us as we walk before him so submissively in our walk each day to be so in tune with the voice of God that when he speaks we understand that it's the voice of God and we're not confused by it but all oh, that we respond as we should. Hallelujah. The power of God. If I sound excited tonight, I am excited. I'm talking about a God who's still on the throne. Hallelujah. If I had my way to go around this globe crying forth with one of the loudest voices I could find, I would say that God is still on the throne, God's still saving the lost, God's still healing the sick, and God is still delivering his children from fiery furnaces of fire. Amen. He has not changed. There were 114 people on that plane that were burned beyond recognition. They could not be identified. They were buried in Westminster, California. I attended the memorial service for them. When I arrived at the cemetery, the first thing that I saw were 114 coffins lined in a straight row. And next to these coffins was one grave 75 feet long waiting to house them. They gave us a list of names of those being buried there that day. And my eyes hurriedly scanned the list of names for my the name of my business partner, Ted Eunice, and I found it. He was one of those that was burned beyond recognition, and he was in the seat right in front of me. I then looked for the names of the mother and daughter who were seated to my left, and I found their names on the list as well. They too could not be identified. They were being buried in that common grave. They were right beside me. I looked for the names of my friends from Newport Beach, California, who were seated right behind me, and I found their names on the list as well. And all of a sudden it dawned upon me that not only had everyone around me died, but not one of them could even be identified. Every one of them was being buried there in that common grave, and yet God delivered me and plucked me from that inferno of fire without a burn of any kind. Hallelujah. I didn't have a singed hair. My clothing didn't catch on fire. There weren't even scorched places upon my clothing. And right now I want you to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. These clothes hang in my closet today, and every once in a while I get them out and I look at them. I never want this to become commonplace. It was a very holy, holy moment of God's great answer to prayer and deliverance. All of a sudden, with people dying all around me, something very wonderful happened to me. The prayer scene in my living room with my mother became a living reality in my thinking. It was the last thing in the world I expected to think about. 
But all of a sudden, my mind was taken over with that memory of that prayer time with her. I could see her tears. I could see her hands resting upon the Word of God. I could hear her prayer. And as that prayer scene began to flood through my mind, all confusion left. I began to think rationally. I began to think clearly. I began to move in a rational manner. All of a sudden, I felt a boldness sweep over me. I wanted to live. I felt a calmness and a peace settle upon me. Praise God for those few moments of prayer that we had together in the home before I left on the trip. And if you don't pray together in your home, you should. It gives you something to hang on to in the moment of despair. And let me assure you, at a time like that, you need everything you can get to hang on to. As I shared this testimony with the doctors in the Canary Islands, they said, Mr. Williams, we're thoroughly convinced that your survival is directly due to your faith. The doctors said that. They're finally catching on, aren't they? Hallelujah. <laughs> It pays to pray. It pays to pray. Praise God for praying mothers. Mothers that will hang on to God for their children. The greatest asset and jewel anyone could ever have is a mother who hangs on to God for her children. I've been blessed with that kind of mother. As that peace settled over me, my mind practically became a computer with the Word of God. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture began to pour through my mind, portions of Scripture. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the God that will deliver you. Scriptures I had learned as a boy in Sunday school, scriptures I had learned as a man growing up, some scriptures I didn't even know I knew were going through my mind. And all of a sudden, portions of scripture from Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, became so real. The second verse says this, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Listen to this. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, and neither will the flame kindle upon thee. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. And I heard it the second time. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither will the flame kindle upon thee. And I knew that God was speaking to me directly from his holy word, and my shoulders went back and my head went high. Circumstances all around me said I would burn, but God's word said I wouldn't, and I knew I wouldn't because God's word said so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I began doing something at that moment that I've never done before in all of my Christian experience. I began yelling and screaming at God. I never yelled at God before. Circumstances said I would burn. God's word said I wouldn't. I began screaming at God, and I said, Father... In the name of Jesus, I stand upon the Word. I stand upon the Word, Father. I stand upon the Word. I stand upon the Word. Over and over. I must have said it a thousand times as I battled my way through those flames. I stand upon the Word. I stand upon the Word. I stand upon the Word. I stand upon the Word, Father. It was all that I had, but hallelujah, it was enough. God's Word became my life. I know now what they mean when they say the Living Bible. The Word of God becomes our life in our most desperate moments. And let me say this to you at this moment, that in order for us to stand upon the Word of God at a moment like that, we must know what the Word of God says. There's no time then to get out your Bible and start thumbing through the pages and say, what page is it on? It doesn't work that way. My Bible was in a briefcase under the seat in front of me burning. I couldn't get it out to read it. I'm not saying that you have to memorize the whole Bible, but I certainly am saying that you must have exposure to God's promises and the Holy Word if you expect the Holy Spirit to minister to you in your most desperate moments by His promises. They tell me there are approximately 70,000 promises in the Holy Bible from God to His people. It behooves us to have a percentage of that 70,000 down here on a permanent basis if we expect God to bring to us to minister through his holy word in moments such as that. A peace settled over me. All of a sudden, there was a tremendous object coming towards me very fast. I knew I was going to be hit. There was no place to duck to get out of its way. The lights were out. The only lights we had were flames. It was difficult to identify objects. I believe it was part of the landing gear of the other plane, but I, I had presence of mind enough to know that that thing was so large that if it hit me, it would pin me down. But the only thing that I could do is to put my hands up in front of me like this to shield myself from that object to help break the impact of the thing I knew I was going to be hit. And that thing kept coming towards me, and all of a sudden it hit me, and it threw me back violently. 
and I found myself responding to that object with a strength that I didn't know was there. And as I shoved that object, I found myself saying, In the name of Jesus! And I don't know what happened to that thing. I never saw it again. Hallelujah. I don't even know what it was, but it didn't pin me down. Hallelujah. Amen. And now, two and a half years later, as I look back over this experience, I'm made to realize that God must have allowed that object to come towards me because it caused me to look up. Up to that time, I hadn't looked up. I'd been so engrossed with everything going on around me, I hadn't looked up. But as I looked up at that object coming towards me, I spotted a hole in the roof. I could see the sky. And I knew there was a way out if I could get up there. I don't know if you've been in a 747 or not, but the ceilings are very high. The false ceiling's at least 10 feet high, and that's being conservative. And between the false ceiling and the roof of the airplane, there's probably another three to five feet. Uh, a 747 is as high as a three-story building. I gazed up at that roof, and I saw the hole, and I saw the sky, and I knew there was a way up, a way out if I could get there. I remember seeing the hole. I remember going through the hole, but I have no recollection of how I got up to the hole. I call that my many rapture. I just don't remember going up. That's all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I don't have any problem anymore with the the message of the resurrection. I don't have any problem anymore with the message of the rapture. My Bible tells me that one of these days, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm going to be called away to be with him forevermore. And if he's going to do all that, he didn't have any problem with that ten feet I needed some help with that day. We were in Alberta, Canada, ministering a few months ago. I had my mother with me. We were in a coffee shop. And she said, Norman, I'd like to believe that as you were fighting your way through those flames, and you were saying, I stand upon the word, 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 that you were building a spiritual ladder up to that hole. And I said, I think I'm going to buy that theory. It wouldn't be the first spiritual ladder God ever built. He did it for Jacob. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he'd do it for Norman if Norman needed a ladder in the 20th century. God's still building spiritual ladders. And if you're in some kind of a hole tonight, you don't belong down there. Let God build you a ladder. And get yourself out of there where God can do something with you. He's still in business. I remember going through the hole. I went over the side of the plane. I was still saying, I stand upon your word. I stand upon your word as I was going out into space. I landed on the wing. It was tilted. It was slippery. It was covered with fuel. On the ground to the right, there were about eight people that had gotten out of the crash. Some were unconscious. Others were jumping out of the plane and landing on them and killing them. As they, as they were there. I knew that if I jumped there, I would kill people. I turned and tried to work my way up the wing. The engines were still going, fire raging in each engine. I knew if I jumped too closely to the engines, I could be sucked in by the jet engine and killed. I knew that the wing was full of fuel. Explosions were still occurring. It would be just a matter of seconds before the whole thing would go, so you don't linger. You take off into space, any space. They say I jumped 30 to 35 feet. I don't know, but it was a long ways down. The moment that my feet touched the ground, I knew in that instant what God had done. Just seconds before, I saw everyone dying around me. But there I was on the ground. I was bleeding. The bones in my left foot were practically all broken and shattered. I was injured. But in that instant, I knew God had kept his word. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, and neither will the flame kindle upon thee. There I stood without a burn of any kind. And that's when I began working my way across the field as rapidly as I could, crying forth hosannas and hallelujahs and praises to my God, as I described to you in this Time magazine picture. When I got about 50 feet away, I fell. I looked back to see what I could see, and I saw two more explosions that took the 7, R-747 in its entirety. The whole thing was gone. I just got 50 feet away from it. About 150 yards down the runway, I could see the KLM exploding violently. I still didn't know we had been hit by that plane. I thought that because of the crowded conditions that our explosion had triggered other explosions, I fully expected to see every plane in that airport to go up. There were 250 people on the KLM 747. Every one of them died. On our plane, there were 418, including the crew. Everyone died except 70. Today, there are 60 of us still living. I'm one of the 60. A number of the 60 that still live are still having skin grafts, and some of them have lost their minds. I want to take time here to praise God for another miracle, the miracle of a sane mind. Oh, hallelujah. 
that I can stand here tonight and coherently share this experience with you in a way that will cause you to reach out to God with brand new faith for your own jet crashes, to me is just as much of a miracle as not being burned in the fire. Again, I'm reminded of that holy scripture that tells us if our minds are stayed upon him, they will be kept in perfect peace. Not only at the time of the crash, but two years later, I haven't even had a bad dream. Isn't that something? Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. I don't want to share this experience without telling you about the love of the Canary Island people. I've never seen such a display of non-commercial love in my life as I did that day. As these two giant 747s were exploding, the people that lived around that airport in their little houses came running out towards the exploding planes, bringing blankets and clothing and jugs of water. Some were rushing up towards the exploding planes, trying to drag people away. I'm told that some lost their lives doing it. Others were driving their little tiny cars out on the field to pick up the dying and injured, to get them to hospitals and clinics. It's a very small island over there. It's very crowded. The streets are very narrow and they drive little tiny, tiny cars. One young man drove his little tiny, tiny car out by me, and he got out of the little tiny, tiny car, and he tried to get me in the little tiny, tiny back seat. And he worked, and he worked, and he worked. It was like trying to put an elephant in a telephone booth. He finally got me in the back seat, and he took off, and he was going 80 miles an hour. I was in the back seat, I should know. And it was raining, and it was foggy, and his windshield wipers weren't working. And we were going 80 miles an hour. And he was leaning out the window, and with this hand, he was a windshield wiper. And with this hand, he was blowing the horn, and at that moment, I began to talk to Jesus all over again. I found myself saying, Father, do you mean to tell me that you spared my life back there to let me die like this? I'll never forget that conversation I had with the Lord that day. Well, we got to the hospital. There was a line of people about two blocks long. I said, what are they doing here? He said, they're here to give blood. Others were getting out of their beds and leaving the hospital to let us have beds to lie in. I've never seen anything like that. We were all hospitalized there for, for three days, and on the third day, the United States government sent in hospital planes from Germany to pick us up and bring us back to the United States. And on that same day, the Pan American officials and the insurance underwriters arrived and they went to the hospitals and clinics to pay the bills for all 70 survivors. They wanted everything to be paid before we left the island. They were told they owed them nothing. They wouldn't take a cent from anybody, not even an insurance company. Isn't that something? Pure love, non-commercial love. Hallelujah. And as I heard all of that information and as I lay in that hospital bed, I said, Father, someday let me come back to this little island. I want to come back over here and I want to thank these people face to face and I want to also let them hear my testimony so that they know that God didn't cause this but human error did and a year ago last March he let me go back it was the most exciting time I've ever had that's another story in itself suffice it to say that I was there three days and in those three days went around the island sharing this testimony and there were over 250 that gave their hearts to Jesus Christ it's exciting God will be glorified in all things, in all things. All that he asks of us is as we are brought through these things to recognize the miracle and to understand that miracles just don't happen for individuals, that, that miracles come into our lives to edify the body of Christ. My life wasn't spared just for the sake of Norm Williams. My life was spared that I might share this just like I'm doing tonight to cause you to reach out to God in a brand new way and let your faith explode and to understand God loves you just as much as he does me. In closing, our families were going through torture, not knowing whether we were alive or dead. It was 12 hours before I could reach my family by telephone. And as I lay in that hospital bed over there, I said, Father, don't let my mother be alone when she hears about the crash. Don't let her be by herself. And then I said, Father, when she hears about the crash, allow the Holy Spirit to be her comforter. That is his ministry. Did you know that? When Jesus went away, he said, I'll send you a comforter. And the moment that he left, the Holy Spirit began his work in the lives of men and women. Our own built-in comforter. Isn't that something? And he'll continue that work until Jesus comes again. God answered both prayers that day. My sister and her husband, who are here in the audience tonight, live about 40 miles from my home and when they heard of this disaster they were the first in our families to hear about it they made their way to our home we live in Palos Verdes 
and they made their way to our home just as rapidly as they could get there. They knocked on the door. My mother answered. She could see by the looks on their faces that something horrible had happened. She inquired as, as to what it was, and in so doing, she said, Is it Norman? And my sister said, Yes, mother, there's been a crash. And my brother-in-law stepped quickly over to my mother and took her by one arm, and my sister took her by the other, fully expecting her to have a stroke or a heart attack or to go into hysterics. She didn't have a stroke, and she didn't have a heart attack, yes. and she didn't go into hysterics. She simply said, bring me my Bible. I want the Word of God. Oh, hallelujah. And they ran, and they got the same Bible that we had prayed over before I left home, and they took it in the living room, and they opened it, and they put it on the coffee table, and they turned on the radio to station KFWB, where the announcer was giving the names of the survivors one by one, one by one. And as that radio announcer was calling the names of the survivors one by one, they had their hands upon the word. And my mother began to petition God, and she said, Father, in the name of Jesus, let Norman Williams' name come over that radio. Let Norman Williams' name come over the radio, Father. Let Norman Williams' name come over the radio. And of course, Norman Williams' name is always the last one on the alphabet. You've got to go through the whole works before you get to Williams. But they persevered in prayer. They hung on to God. And all of a sudden, the radio announcer said, and Norman Williams of Palos Verdes, California, is the survivor. And they said, all of heaven broke loose in that living room. They said they had a revival and a camp meeting there like you haven't heard about for a long time. <laughs> Praise God. And as I've shared this with you in these moments, I've spoken to you about miracles that took place in my life in fractions of seconds that day. But oh, as I read and study the Holy Word of God, I'm made to realize that these miracles that I've shared with you today can't even begin to compare to the greatest miracle God has offered to mankind, the miracle called salvation. Amen. To think that the God of the universe would send His only begotten Son to the earth to die on a cross, that we might have an avenue of approach to Him for the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Of course, there will never be a greater miracle than the one called salvation. And to think that that same God of that same universe will look down into the lowest gutter of sin and see men and women whose minds and souls and bodies are ravaged by sin and yet in his great love will reach down and pluck them and in an instant in a twinkling of an eye transform them into a brand new creature setting the captives free, breaking the bondages of sin. Hallelujah! Of course there could never be a greater miracle than the one called salvation. For those, Father, who are going through jet crashes so severe that they don't know where else to turn, Father. There are those in this room tonight that are going through the marital jet crash. The home is about to be destroyed. The, the family is about to be ruined, Father. There's children affected by this. Oh, what a severe jet crash. But God, you stand here tonight in their midst saying, I have the answer. Dare to stand upon the word. There are those in this room tonight that are going through the physical jet crash. My father, they're so sick. The doctors don't seem to give them any hope. Oh, Father, you're the God of the impossible. And Father, they're in the middle of a jet crash and there's flames all around them and circumstances say they're going to burn and die but you say that you will heal them. And we stand upon that word and we accept it tonight. We proclaim victory. We proclaim victory for the troubled mind, the deaf ears, the blinded eyes, the cataracts, the heart condition, the lung condition, the arthritic condition, the back condition, the legs, the feet, the nerves. Father, we're asking for deliverance. Not in fear or apprehension. We're asking in faith. Because you said, Father, we could ask what we will if we come before your throne in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that's how we're coming tonight, in the name of Jesus. Father, those that are going through financial crisis and that jet crash known as the lack of material needs. We ask for victory. And any other jet crash that may be represented, we ask for miracles, and we praise you for them. But Father, we're concerned most of all tonight for that unsaved person. 
This is what this is all about. That they too might find the assurance of eternal life. That's the most important. That they'll not leave here without knowing Jesus. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, when I started giving this testimony two and a half years ago, I promised God that I would never share this testimony without praying a sinner's prayer, without praying a prayer of repentance. I want you to pray with me sincerely. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. I receive him now as my personal Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. I am so sorry for everything in my life that has kept me from God. I praise you now that I receive forgiveness from every sin in my life. I will follow Jesus as my personal Savior for the rest of my life. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father, you have heard these prayers. Father, I pray for each person that has stood for the sinner's prayer tonight. The fact that they would raise their hand and the fact that they would stand indicates to me that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, you said if we would believe and if we would ask for forgiveness of sin, and if we would confess Jesus as Savior, that we would be saved. These people have done that tonight, Father, and now by faith we receive salvation. And we rejoice in this salvation, and we say thank you, Father, for saving their soul. I pray, Father, that you will lead them and guide them and protect them and keep them from harm and evil and temptation and keep them from sin. Give them a spiritual appetite for all things of God. My Father, that you will lead them to a church that will teach them the whole Bible. God, help them to become involved in that church, that they will study the Word and become a mature Christian. Thank you for each one of them. And Father, those that are standing because of jet crashes in their lives, we proclaim victory in the name of Jesus Christ for every one of them. We thank you for victory right now. Hallelujah. Victory in Jesus. We accept it in the name of Jesus. And Father, you know what these jet crashes are. You know what caused them, and you know what the answer is for them. And so we proclaim victory, my Father, and we receive it by faith in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.